trades back to you with another weekly trade ideas list and also just an overall technical analysis video if you're tuning in for the first time we go over a couple individual tickers we go over economic data for the week i've been adding a little mix in going over a seasonality chart and then we also go over the indexes and pretty much just the technicals behind those first we're going to get into the economic calendar here this week we actually do have a lot more data than the previous week last week we did have a couple data sets, but the most important thing was NVIDIA earnings, of course, and then pretty much the Jackson Hole speech, which ended up being pretty neutral on Friday. Market kind of brushed it off, and we actually did have a pretty good rally throughout the day. I feel like the markets were expecting maybe a little bit more hawkish talk from Fed Powell, and we didn't really get that. So markets did pretty good on Friday, even after selling off very, very hard the day after NVIDIA earnings, probably the worst day in months i think since march or so just an awful awful sell-off day and it was just straight sell programs all day so it was very very oversold very very quickly that could also play a role in why we bounced on friday so for monday here august 28th we're looking at nothing for data but then tuesday we do have the jolts job openings this can definitely move the market and then we also have consumer confidence wednesday we do have the adp employment we also have the gdp revision we have advanced u.s trade balance in goods advanced retail inventories, advanced wholesale inventories, and pending home sales. So I would say the ADP employment, the GDP, and also the pending home sales are probably the most potential to move the market. And that's just going off what I've seen in the past. And Thursday, we do have personal income. We have personal spending. We also have the PCE index, core PCE, PCE year over year, core PCE year over year. And this is honestly the Fed's preferred inflation gauge. They actually prefer this over CPI. If you've watched my videos before, I've explained that in the past. They prefer this over the CPI. So it can definitely move the market. And then Friday, most important day, we have the non-farm payrolls. We also have unemployment rate, U.S. hourly wages, ISM manufacturing and construction spending. So the non-farm payrolls is pretty much the biggest data set of the week. I would say that this is the most important. And then probably second would be the PCE, but people are really tuned into the labor market. And I would say the non-farm payrolls usually moves us the most. It's only because the PCE comes after the CPI. So the CPI drops and then the PCE comes a couple weeks after. So inflation data is almost like baked into the price. And that's why the PCE doesn't really move it as much, but it does have potential to move it. But when it comes to the non-farm payrolls, this can definitely move the market. I mean, I would say anywhere from a half a percent to probably 1% on the indexes. It just depends, you know, how extreme the reading is. So as for the economic calendar, pretty data stacked week, especially Thursday and Friday. So Thursday and Friday, definitely going to move the market. I can kind of show you a quick seasonality chart here too. So I just selected the 28th, which is Monday, up until just before the big drop historically happens and that's going to be from the 28th up until the 17th i just want to show you we do kind of enter a chop period here but there is an up thrust towards the beginning of september but for this week if we went exactly this week if we went from 28th to the first which is friday you can see that we do average a negative 0.28 percent return so it's nothing crazy and there is a little small drop here so historically the odds to the upside are not in our favor, but I do have a couple long trades that I'm looking at just because they're at support. But I just want to show you the seasonality chart real quick. And you can see it doesn't get too bad until after, you know, the halfway through September is going to be about the 18th or so halfway point is when it starts to get really big to the downside historically. Obviously, it doesn't have to pan out. But this is 25 years worth of data pretty much just implemented into a seasonality chart. So you can see the big drop here. And that's going to be about halfway, you know, through September. So I just want to show you that real quick. And then the Almanac, you can see Monday, there's really, really nothing. But then Tuesday, August 3rd to last trading day, S&P up 19 years in a row, 2003 through 2021. So this is a historically bullish day, which is interesting. And you can see the probabilities here this is the dow s p nasdaq you got an 85.7 you got 90.5 for the s p and 81.0 for the nasdaq so probabilities are pretty good for that day 
And then August, next to last trading day, S&P down 17 of the last 26 years. And you can see the probabilities, Dow, S&P, NASDAQ, pretty low. NASDAQ is actually a little bit higher. And these are probabilities pretty much showing the chance of rising. And then Thursday, last trading day in August, S&P up 13 of the last 22 years. And then first trading day in September, S&P down nine of last 14. So a lot of, a lot of ups and downs historically. We'll have to see how that goes. But that just kind of goes in sync here with the seasonality chart. There's a lot of, you know, chop kind of just up and down. And, you know, the market might be trying to, you know, pretty much wait for a read and wait for a good signal before it, you know, makes a trend. Because right now the, the daily chart on S&P is actually not that great. Uh, the, the daily candles are, aren't really flashing any signals or anything. And we'll go over that, you know, in a little bit. But I just wanted to show you that. So that's the seasonality chart and the almanac that we went over. So now we'll go into the individual tickers. I do only have three this week. I had four, but I took the other one off just because I didn't, I feel like it wasn't really, you know, up to par with what I want in my list. But, you know, I could be wrong. It was General Motors. That was the fourth one I had, but I, I took it off. Our first one here, this is UPS. You can see we do have major support here at about 166 or so. Had a pretty nice reaction off of that. This is also a big demand zone all the way from 2022 that it's been reacting and bouncing off prior. And it bounced, you know, around May, uh, early June here. And it's pretty much back to that same zone. And I feel like this could catch a short-term bounce at least. It looks like this is all sell inbounds pretty much. There's really nothing. You could call this little base candle here a little supply candle. So that could be a little resistance. But overall, it looks pretty oversold here. The slow stochastic is crossing up. So I'm looking for upside on this, a potential bounce play. And UPS is kind of more of like a value trade, like people kind of view it as like a safety play. And the correlation with the S&P is a little bit different. I mean, it's not like directly following the S&P. It's had, you know, green days when S&P is red, and it's also, you know, had red days when S&P is green. So it's not a 100% correlation type of play. And I feel like it's got a mind of its own. And even if the market's going down or, you know, just like the seasonality chart shows us, we have a little dip or anything on the S&P. I feel like this could still catch a little bounce just because people might flock to it as a safety play or a value trade. So for price targets, obviously there's really not much resistance or anything. You could probably look at this little wick right here at about 172.16. Added the moving averages. You can see the nine EMAs right here. It would need to get over that obviously. So when you're trading under the nine and 21 EMA, it's usually a pretty good idea to use them as price targets if you're going counter trend and you are going counter trend if you're trending below these. So this is technically in a downtrend just because we're under the 9 and 21 combo. Even if you drew a downtrend line, it would still, you know, kind of be within a downtrend. So it's smart to use the moving averages as some sort of price target if you're, you know, entering below or anything like that. You can see the first area at the 9 is going to be about 170. It's going to need to get over that. And then there's also 21 right here at about 174.50. It'll need to get over that as well, you know, to break the cycle here. You can probably just look at those as three price targets so you got your nine ema at about 170 that's going to need to get over that about 172.16 which is this little wick high and then also the 21 which is going to be about 174 currently but obviously that's going to change as price is moving moving averages pretty much just adjust after each daily bar if you're looking at it on the one day time frame if you're looking at it on the 15 minute time frame the moving average is just going to adjust after each 15 minute bar etc so it looks pretty good for calls here. I'm going to be looking at calls on it. Uh, risk off, obviously, probably, you know, below 166. That's a short-term risk off. If you wanted a more cushioned risk off area, it's probably going to be under 164 or so, and that's the demand zone low. But there is, you know, more supports here. I just feel like options, if it got under 164, that's going to start killing the premium. So it might be wise to use, you know, 166 or 164 as your risk off or stop loss, just because, you know, you're trading options and any change from, you know, being in the money to being going back out of the money, pretty much going to mess with your deltas. It's uh, all, you're also pretty much playing against theta, which is time decay. And that's going to expire more and more you know, as you get closer to your expiration date. So it's good to use, you know, tight stops, relatively tight stops with options. If you're going 30 plus days out, you could probably use 164. Uh, if you're doing anything shorter, definitely use 166. So that's for UPS here, looking at calls, price targets, your first one, 9 EMA, 172, and then the 21. All right, next we're going into FCX. So you can see FCX has a pretty nice demand zone here. 
If you didn't know, FCX is actually tied to gold and also copper. Most of their business is copper, but then they do have another percentage of gold as well. So this kind of does correlate with the copper futures chart and also with a regular gold futures chart as well. They kind of mix together, but this is essentially a metals play. So with metals plays, it's usually pretty reliant on the US dollar. You obviously want to see the US dollar losing value for metals to start going up and vice versa. If you wanna see metals go down, you wanna see the dollar go up. So lately, obviously the US dollar has been getting stronger and stronger, it broke out. We go over it every week, breaking over major levels and gold specifically has been having a hard time. And you can see now we're finally getting into a demand zone here on FCX, it's a drop base rally demand zone. It's a pretty good demand zone. I mean, this is a pretty hard selling that led to a big buy imbalance. So this area is worth watching for a bounce. If it can curl up here, obviously that could take you up to supply. This is a drop base drop supply zone. And that'd be your first price target if it could get up there. So if it did get up there, obviously it's kind of going to make a head and shoulders pattern. If you guys tuned in last week, we actually had PLTR in a similar pattern to this. I was looking for a bounce up to pretty much it's shoulder area or somewhere close to the first shoulder it did exactly that and rejected right off of it so that's why this is this is the highest i can see it and if you tuned in last week and you also tuned in into the video where we had netflix you know exactly why this is the highest we can see it for right now because we just don't know if it's going to make that shoulder and with netflix and pltr they both made a shoulder and then went back down so when you see these patterns play over and over and over you just know or at least you can get a strong feeling that that's going to happen. And with PLTR and Netflix, uh, they both happen. So same thing for FCX here. This is the highest I could see it if it can get up there. Just because you have no idea what it's going to do. If it makes the shoulder, it comes back down. It'll just come back down to the demand zone. You'll wish you took profit up here. So you might as well keep conservative price targets and just adjust after each daily bar if you're swing trading or just in real time if you're day trading. So that shoulder pretty much just correlates with this area as well. This little 4075 area. You can see there's a re rejection here and also rejection here. Kind of acted as support right here, acted as support right here, acted as a breakdown level right here. So this 4075 just aligns perfectly with this supply candle. And that's why that'll probably be the overall price target if it can get up there and bounce. But this is a nice demand zone. Obviously, we'll need to see the dollar come down a little bit more. And that's definitely a possibility because it's coming up to a pretty big resistance, if I'm not mistaken. And it could reject, you know, at the 104s. So we'll see. And even a regular gold chart looks pretty oversold as well. I think GLD chart I was looking at was also holding support. That kind of goes with, you know, FCX maybe bottoming out here. Obviously they're they're tied to copper too, so I probably need to look at a copper chart, the copper futures, but I mean, metals overall they kind of have a similar chart and they kind of go hand in hand together. So FCX here looking at cause maximum I could see it up in the early 40s. That'll make the shoulder, or at least attempt to, and then maybe it'll try to come back down after that. But we'd have to see how it reacts to supply, if it can get up there. So FCX, looking at calls. All right, and last but not least, for our individual tickers, we're looking at Oxy here. Ticker symbol OXY. This is strictly an energy play. And you can see it's breaking its trend line here, so that's what caught my eye the most. I'm a pretty big trend line trader. I like to look at trend lines, especially on the daily chart. They're most reliable. You see, you got a test one, test two, test three. Failing right here, wasn't able to hold up. And you can see it's actually back tested it a couple times right here, back tested. Also back tested right here. So it touched the line directly. Obviously with these wicks, not the prettiest, right? It's not screaming downside just yet because you got buyers pushing it back up uh, at about this 60, 80s level or the 61s. So about 60, 80 to 61, buyers keep showing up, forming these wicks, showing that there's still buy pressure going up into the rest of the session for each daily bar. So what we need to see is that zone breaking. So we need to see it get under 684. There's obviously a pretty big support here at 60 flat or 6003 specifically, another level at about 5897. So we need to get under 6084. What we'll do, we'll add an alert. Just right click the line after you add it and we'll name it breakdown hit create and simple as that and then that'll be waiting for us so it'll need to break under that and then you'll want to look for like a 30 minute bar at least maybe like a 15 minute close under the 6084 i prefer to use a 30 minute or one hour to see a true breakdown but we'll have to see so the only reason why we want to see this breakdown first is just because of these wicks 
That's why I don't really trust this breakdown just yet. With these types of wicks, you can easily see a push up back to the upside. That's where that's why we want to see these lows at 6084 get taken out. And that can start taking you to your first support here at 60 and then also the 5897. And then you know if I can get under that area, there's a pretty big flush zone right here. You probably call this a little demand zone as well. So that probably would be the max I could see it if it was able to break under these three levels. It would probably, you know, come down to about here and try to curl up about there. But, you know, these can also be curl up levels as well. So you need to watch those very carefully just because you got a big reaction candle here. You got a pretty nice buy imbalance here. And, you know, they could try to prop it back up at these lows just based off of, you know, past lows and past experience with price action. It looks like they'd try to, you know, maybe try to hold it up about there. So you'd want to see, you know, one day close under 60.84 and then a one day close under 60.03 and then a one day close under 58.97. And that would kind of take you down to the demand zone overall. So actually here looking at puts, but like I said, set that alert, wait for 60.84 to get taken out. And that could take you a little bit lower. Obviously, projection would go invalid. If it broke back over the trend line, it would probably just go back to square one and start trying to go back up again. And also, these types of plays are just going to follow the crude oil futures. So keep a close eye on those. Oil and energy overall is definitely being, you know, kind of silently screaming back up, which is understandable because kind of starting to push into that recession theme again. You got yields going crazy bonds overall going crazy you got us dollar going crazy uh, and lots of times you'll see that bid in energy when all those are going crazy as well so it's kind of just going hand in hand so that's why you got to be careful wait for the 6084 breakdown before trying to short energy all right next we're going into the indexes so our first one here we're looking at the spx s p 500 spy whatever you want to call it i ended up switching to the spx after trading views spy chart one day had a messed up candle that wasn't correct the high and low just wasn't right so i started going to the spx just because that one candle did throw off if you were trying to chart so i've been using the spx for the past couple weeks works pretty good so last week we we're looking at this demand zone here you can see it's a drop base rally demand zone this is the one we covered last week we saw this reaction candle here on the 18th of Friday. I was expecting a bounce in the market and especially was looking for 4450 to get tested as long as we closed over this 4385, which is this support that we covered last week. We want to see a one day close over that in order to fill this area up, the sell and bounce and get to supply and the previous back test levels we covered at 4450s. So it did exactly that. We got our close over the 4385 on Monday. Had a little dip into it and then held that support and literally just filled the whole sell and bounce perfectly and hit our price target within a week, which is crazy because this 4450 zone, I wasn't expecting it to get tested in one week. I just wasn't expecting it to hit that fast. And like I said, if you keep your expectations low in the stock market, sometimes you'll get surprised and it feels that much better when your price targets hit and your analysis was correct when your expectations are low and you won't get you know as disappointed if you're wrong and you just keep your expectations low because the market does have a randomness factor to it. So there's no reason to be upset or, you know, let it bother you because, you know, the market's just the market. You know, it's not against you. It's not here to hurt you. It's not here to, you know, make you look stupid. So yeah, last week our analysis was great and it worked perfectly. Got exactly what we were looking for. Thursday was when the tide shifted. Uh, NVIDIA had earnings and also it was pretty much just jitters going into Jackson Hole which was on Friday, Jerome Powell's speech, and ended up closing down 1.35%. But look where it reacted and rejected right off our supply and also our 4450s backtest area that we've been covering. If I show you on the 15 minute here, you can see perfect rejection on Thursday, right at the supply and the 4450s, just like you know I was expecting. And then also 4385 held the support really nicely. So Thursday, actually, I did try to buy the dip on the NASDAQ. It was dipping much lower, much faster, and overall, it was just down more. So I figured I'd try to you know, go for a bounce play. It just got very oversold very fast, so I tried to go counter trend, and I ended up being wrong. ended up taking some losses that day. So it wasn't my best week you know, trading or anything by any means. You know, We had some good ones, had some bad ones, but Thursday, I did take a couple losses, which sucks. But if I would have stuck to my original analysis, looking for resistance at our supply, at our resistance, and just traded the SPX instead of the NASDAQ, you know, even though their analysis was similar, this one was on point. So it would have been nice to catch this to the downside. I unfortunately didn't, but, you know, good for you if you did. But yeah, you could see the 4385 here on Tuesday, just it's great support. 
and this is great resistance. So we're just going to go into next week with the same outlook. Keep these same levels as long as we're holding over the 4385. I feel like this big Thursday sale and balance candle, this big red one can fill back up and head back up to our regular 4450s resistance area. So this week I feel like it won't get up to the 4450 as fast as it did last week just because our big data sets aren't till the end of the week. So we'll have to see how Thursday and Friday goes. But overall, I feel like we can work our way back up to the supply in 4450s. Despite, you know, the fact that the seasonality is showing a little dip, we are still over the 4385. We're also still over demand. And overall, you know, it's still holding structure pretty good. If we started breaking under 4385 and closing under that, I would change, you know, change my tone a little bit and probably look for a flush back down to demand. But right now it's holding. So as long as we open over this level on Monday, the 4385, I feel good about continuing to bounce upward. But like I said, I just feel like it won't get up there as fast as last week. Last week it happened in a couple days. We just don't have those type of events until Thursday or Friday. So maybe they'll try to front run it and, you know, run it up into the data similar to what we saw last week. But I feel like we had a little bit more to be excited about last week and just kind of get that front run up into Jackson Hole, front run up into NVIDIA earnings, et cetera. And this week, I feel like this candle just kind of threw us off a little bit. You know, this kind of does throw the structure off a little bit and people are kind of a little bit more worried that, you know, they can get rugged like this and, you know, one day. So it kind of does, you know, bring some fear a little bit and kind of some uncertainty into this. But either way, VIX, you know, closed down pretty low, still holding structure. It looks pretty good for a bounce. And hopefully we can end up hitting our same target that we were looking at prior. I just don't really have a timeline for it. Uh, same thing as last week. You know, I didn't have a timeline for this either. I just felt like this price target was going to hit, you know, maybe within a few weeks, maybe within a week. I just don't put a timeline on the market. I just let it do its thing day by day. So SPX here, you're looking pretty good for a potential move back up to 4450s over time. All right, next we're going into the NASDAQ or the QQQ. So last week we were focused on this demand zone here. We were looking for a bounce up, at least up into 360, 340s, because that's this previous support. We did that in one day. So Monday ripped up into our 360, 340 and actually closed over it. And once we got the close over that, it had a similar fade to SPX, filled up this area and also hit its previous back test level resistance, which is at the 370s. And we were looking for you know that to happen as well, as long as we got over the 360, 340s. So analysis was good on QQQ as well. All we needed was that, you know, dip below. Obviously, that looked a little scary. But then once we closed back within the demand zone on this Friday candle at about 358 or so, that's the close. This is the low at about 357.60. So once we reclaim that, it's pretty much a straight shot and, you know, pretty good probability that we could bounce back up at least up into 363. And this week, you can see we're still over it briefly. We closed at 364. So we are briefly over that level. We're still inside the demand. This is a drop based rally demand zone. So this zone has been working pretty good. It even ripped off of it on Friday, pulled directly into it, had a nice you know green shoot up. So this demand zone is very good. People are buying at this area. And we're also still closing over structure. We're still holding structure overall. So I feel like we could see a bounce again, maybe feel the sell and bounce candle back upward. I'm not sure about how fast it would do it. Like I said, on SPX, I don't really just expect it to do that within a week. It's pretty rare that it does something like that. And you know, with data coming out Thursday and Friday, we may not see a huge move until after that and people start pricing in whatever comes out. You know, like I said, there could be front running uh, people kind of front ran last week. We front ran up into NVIDIA earnings. We front ran up into Jackson Hole. And then and that's kind of when people started to de-risk once we got closer to the event. So obviously that can still happen. We could, you know, run up Monday, Monday Tuesday, Wednesday, and then de-risk at the same thing as we saw last week. But, you know, just keep your expectations low. This is a pretty big red candle. This could leave people just a tad bit shaky and a little bit more reluctant to enter. But either way, still holding structure. So, you know, if you got some cojones and you have good risk management and can still try to buy the dips, I did on Friday and it, it worked out for me. Despite me taking a loss on Thursday, I didn't let that, you know, mess me up too much. Took a couple losses that day trying to buy the dip and then still stuck to my plan the next day, still trying at our demand zone. I made about 25% or something on Friday. So didn't shake me too bad. And I'll probably go with the same plan again this week, you know, just looking for bounces. As long as we're holding over the 363, 40 structure, still holding demand. Maybe if we even dip inside of this, I would still be willing to 
you know, give it a try. And, you know, you do want other signals as well, like the VIX. You want the VIX going lower, DXY, you know, going lower. You want other things supporting your thesis that the market will go up. You don't want to just buy the dip just based off levels. Uh, you can, of course, and it works, but it is good to keep in mind other things, especially with the bond yields going crazy. You want to watch just bonds in general, VIX, dollar, all that good stuff. So QQQ here looking pretty good for a bounce back up. Hopefully it can fill up this sell imbalance. This will eventually fill, I'm guessing. It usually always does. It's kind of like a gap, right? We we kind of fill up that unavoidable area pretty fast, and it's kind of like a liquidity zone, and eventually it can fill back up. And like I said, gaps will fill just about 80% of the time. I believe that's the percentage, maybe a little bit less. But view sell and balance candles like this is kind of like a gap as well, just because we go down so fast, eventually it gets bought back up. And you can see, I mean, these three sell and balance candles right here, fill back up very fast. So it, the market just kind of works like that. And you, you know, you try to sell out once you get into supply candles, you look for the big green candles. Those are the areas you kind of want to start looking to take profit at because with demand, you're looking for red candles. So you're looking for the red day that led to buy imbalance. That's your demand. And then supply, you're looking for your green day that led to your sell imbalance and that's your supply. So these green candles can be viewed as base candles for supply. That's kind of why we fill back up the reds and then we start seeing resistance at the greens and then same thing with demand, just inverse. So QQQ here looking pretty good for a bounce. As long as we hold over 363.40 is in demand, I'd feel pretty good about a bounce back up. Obviously, if we start going under that and we go under about 357.50s, that takes you straight down to the 354.70s low, which is this low right here. And if that doesn't hold up, that's a big breaker structure that takes you a little bit lower. So but right, right now, you know, we're still holding over it. So I'm not too bearish. VIX relatively low. Dollar uh, starting to get a little bit scary, but we are coming up to resistance. And we'll go over that in a little bit. So looking for a bounce. I feel pretty good about the market not, you know, going down too much, at least until halfway through September. And once you get to that halfway point, that's when the market historically starts getting very, very weak. So you want to be careful there. Maybe pick up some hedges, buy some puts, protect your portfolio. If you're a long-term investor, if you're a trader, it might be wise to look at some puts about that time. All right, next we're going into the IWM, which had a totally different fate than this, the SPX and the QQQ. You can see it really didn't bounce as much as the others. Last week, we were looking for a move up into 189.24, or at least the 189 area. And like I said, you can't put a, you know, like a timeline on the market. The market's just going to do what it does. And you can see we did not hit the 189s last week or within a week. But overall, we're still holding our drop base rally demand zone that we covered last week. We have a nice wick off the zone as well. Even had a pretty nice green day on Wednesday. So it did bounce off the demand we were looking at. You might have just had to stick to day trades or short-term trades on it, but it did have a nice reaction to it. And then eventually just came down just a little. Overall, though, really nice wick. This shows that buyers pushed it back up. And maybe we can see a bounce. So I'm looking for the same thing, just a move up to 189s or so. And the reason for that is because that's this previous resistance. So we're just using, you know, past price points as price targets. And you just don't want to put a timeline on it because, you know, the market can do anything. Just, you know, adjust as each daily bar gets closed. Uh, if you're day trading, just adjust in real time. So 189 is not just going to hit in a day or anything. You know, you got to give it a week. You got to give it two weeks. Sometimes you got to give it a little bit longer. But as long as your structure is holding, there's a chance it's going to bounce back up and hit that price target. Reason why it wasn't really able to do anything last week, I believe it's just an overall weakness in banks and the financial sector. That's probably why it didn't really do as well as the SPX and the QQQ. Did have a small run up, but like I said, you know, it did wick down to a new low on Friday, but but it did get bought back up relatively quick and closed up about half a percent. So IWM, I'm looking for a bounce still up to 189s as long as the structure is holding, as long as these demands are holding looks pretty good for a bounce back up obviously if it starts breaking under the second demand zone which is this area from over here it's under 178 that's where trouble starts to come in and it can get scary so got to be careful under that but for right now it looks like people can still show up buyers might still try to show up and overall this wick i feel like it looks pretty good for a push up and it could take you up to 189s so we'll see all right next we're going into the vix so last week we were focused on that what is that 1830s rejection and i said this red candle looked pretty good to take us below 17s we wanted to see it close under 17 to take us to 1553 and that would take the s p higher it was able to do that 
And then right at Thursday, we tapped 1550s and literally just a huge, huge candle. And that's when the, the sell pressure came in, big downside. Uh, VIX was up almost 8% that day and then rejected 17 again and then came back down to 1553. So these two candles are just very bipolar. I could even show you on the 15 minute time frame here. So I'll show you the extremes. You could see Tuesday, we were briefly over the 17 mark, but then eventually came below it. Wednesday, rejected off 17 very aggressively. This is when the market bounced very heavily. We even gapped down on Thursday, but then the selling pretty much just picked up very massively right at the open and held up 1553. So anything you see green is an extreme level I've marked. And anything red is just kind of like a just a regular resistance point. But you can see why the green marks are your extremes. You got a really nice hold up here at 1553, just straight ripped off of it. And you got very aggressive downside once you get under 17. And also just overall pretty strong rejections to the 17s area. You can see Friday, there's kind of a fake out at the 17, right? We got a 15 minute close over 17, but then that was instantly invalidated with this red candle it'll close back under and that pretty much set the tone for the rest of the day. So your first initial breakout confirmed bar isn't always law. It's not always something you want to abide by. Sometimes you need to wait for confirmation, especially with an event like Jackson Hole. This little breakout could get invalidated very quickly and it did. Literally the candle right after closed back under 17s and that took us lower. And then it actually tried to hold up at 1553 again on Friday. There's actually a little dip towards the end of the day. So very accurate levels. It's the same levels we've been covering for weeks. And like I said, I have the extremes marked in green and then regulars just marked in red. Obviously, 1553 has been one of our extreme levels. Once we get over it, we have very hard shoot ups. Once we get below it, pretty aggressive selling in the VIX. Uh, likewise, with 17, you got a strong wick, strong rejections, strong rejections. Uh, even a strong move over it. And then your regular red, I only have at 1831 because of these two little small rejection areas. That's where this little area originated from. But it ended up being a very strong rejection level at 1831, as we saw last Friday. And then 20 is just self-explanatory. If you track the VIX, you know 20 is just an extreme. Pretty much always, once the, once the VIX starts getting over 20, that's when people start to get really scared. And it's, it's also a pretty big resistance point as well, as you see all these arrows over here. You got an arrow right here, strong rejections at 20. So I just wanted to explain the levels a little bit. For this week, we need to see a close under 1553. If they can close under that, that takes you to your 2021 low, which actually held the support here, also held the support here. Uh, once it broke over that here, pretty nice shoot up. And then once I got over 15, that's or 1550, that's when it really picks up and it takes you into 17s. We need to see the close under the 1553. We'll probably try to maybe back test it on the shorter term time frames and then fall to the 1473, kind of like what we saw on this 17, uh, back tested 17, hard rejection. Likewise, on Wednesday, you could see it wicked up into 17, sold off. So maybe we see something like that if we can close under 1553, or maybe it'll just, you know, straight flush down into it, but you know, nothing ever just goes straight up or down all the time. And then if it can get under 1473, you do have one more 2021 low from two years ago at 1410. If it can break under both of those, the 2021 lows, it's pretty much a straight shot to 1273. And that's your most recent lows from June and also your most recent low from July. Under your double bottom support. And people say, you know, it's pointless to chart the VIX, but you could see it's not. And, you know, these levels that we've been covering for weeks just proves it. And I've showed you on the shorter term time frames, even today, how, how it reacted to 17 and 1550s just perfectly. And they're also just, you know, velocity zones. So if it gets over or under them, it, it goes crazy as well. So it's not just support or resistance. They're also kind of like breakout and breakdown levels and also just overall, you know, velocity zones that you want to keep an eye on. So that's for the VIX. You want to see that move under 1553. I would like to see that so I can see the market go higher. If it starts, you know, holding this up though at 1553 and you start seeing aggressive bids and, you know, hard upside on the VIX, that's where you want to, you know, kind of be a little bit more skeptical and maybe don't, you know, trade calls yet. Because that could just take it straight up to 17 as we saw uh, Thursday, held up 1553 and went straight up. So just got to be careful. Look for the break on 1553. That's a great signal to go lower for the VIX and that would take the market higher. Otherwise, you know, uh, if you want to see the market go lower, you're just going to want to see 1553 hold. Also see a break over 17 and just kind of go from there. But, you know, 17 is going to be your focus. If you're bearish, I'm personally, you know, with the SPX and the QQQ holding structure, I feel like they look fine to bounce and maybe fill up the sell and balance candle like I showed you. 
you know, but anything could happen. But if you're bearish, you want to see the market go down. No, 17 is your focus. You want to see a close back over that. And you want to see, you know, aggressive moves over that as well. And that'll just take you to 1831 again. Uh, but those are your, you know, two upside levels. And then you got 1553 and 1473 is your two downsides. You just need to close under 1553 to take you to the next one. All right. And last but not least, we're going into the DXY or the US dollar. And last week we were focused on that 103.50s. I'm just waiting for it to load here. So we were focused on the 103.50s. I wanted to see a rejection in this in order to take the market higher. It did reject on Tuesday and it came all the way down to 103, which is our 2020 COVID peak. And just like the VIX chart, the 2020 COVID peak is kind of my extreme level. You know, I'm always looking for breaks over or breaks under on it. And also it's pretty good support as well and has been for a while. And you can see once we dip down on Tuesday, you can see the wick on this bar right here. It just straight ripped off of it. So we really need to see that close under 103. So we want to see the rejection and the close under 103. It was not able to do that. The market still went up, so that's good. But, you know, the DXY did kind of invalidate the move down once it held 103 support. And then it eventually it closed over 103.50s. And once you get over 103.50s and close over that, that takes you straight to 104.70s. As we see right here, it topped out at 104.40s. So it's very close. And right now it's kind of mid range. So I don't really know what to expect here. Obviously, it got close enough to this to maybe expect a rejection but you got slow stochastic still crossed up here we have the moving averages we're over all of them so we're over the nine we're over the 21 we're over the 50 and we're over the 200 so your dark blue is your 200 ema it's kind of your longer term moving average we had a fake out over that back here so you know anything could happen but the only difference is is now we're getting a little bit closer to the yellow 21 crossing over the 200 which is a pretty pretty bullish signal for anything if you see the you know the 9 and the 21 crossing the 200 that's a pretty good signal and you can see last time it failed here for the yellow to get over the blue this time it's way closer so it's a little spooky but overall you know we do have that 10470s resistance it's a pretty big level if it can start getting over that that takes it up to 10580s but right now you know we're still pretty far away from that and i feel like it might have a little bit more upside and might need to reject a little bit closer to this this is kind of mid-range right so i don't feel good about saying what it's going to do from here because it's still an uptrend it still has a little bit further to go before getting up to the 10470s obviously you can kind of go off the general area you don't have to go directly off the wick high and you know you can miss out on a lot of stuff by you know trying to be too precise but i would like to see it get just a little bit closer to the top and then maybe i could look for a rejection Obviously, the maximum I can see a downside this week is at one of three fifties. It pull down into that, maybe try to make a base or a higher low and try to bounce about there if it pulls back. But right now it's mid range, right? So I can't really say too much about it other than it's still in an uptrend. You're still trending over your nine. You're still trending over your 21. As you see, the green is your nine. Yellow is your 21. It's your classic uptrend moving averages that's kind of what you use to gauge an uptrend but we're also broken over the 200 which is your dark blue here so overall very bullish dollar looks like it can go higher still you're still over all your moving averages and like i said it needs to get under 103 in order to change the tide and 103 is your 2020 covid peak and it's also just your overall kind of a velocity zone you can see the velocity picked up here back in may once it got over 103 velocity picked up downside once it got here velocity picked up downside again right here so 103 is kind of just your velocity zone and that goes all the way back to when the dollar peaked out in 2020 during covid that's why that's marked green that's why i have those vix levels marked green they're extremes they're past price points where you know the price or the ticks were very extreme and there's very hard velocity to the upside or downside or they're you know just had crazy wicks big volatility etc so that's the video guys i'm gonna get this chopped up edited and sent out i love you guys make sure you like comment and subscribe dxy here for final thoughts i feel like it could just maybe pull back a little bit down to 103.50s but that's the lowest i could see it because they could try to make a base there love you guys